We begin this morning with Senator Lamar Alexander, Chairman of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Chairman Alexander served as the 45th Governor of Tennessee and the 5th United States Secretary of Education before joining the U.S. Senate in 2003. During his 15 years in Congress, Chairman Alexander has championed bi a bipartisan approach to a range of issues, including health care reform, background checks for gun buyers, and federal financial aid. Welcome, Chairman Alexander. Joining him on stage is my colleague, The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack. Bob, the floor is yours. Thanks, Diana. Senator, thanks for, for joining us this morning. Um, we, you know, bipartisanship is something that uh, many would say is kind of evaporated uh, over the years. Um, but I want to start with some news of the day. There's some bipartisan concern that the president will one way or the other oust Robert Mueller. Do you think that's a good idea? Uh, no. <laughs> Why? Well, from the president's point of view, it doesn't solve anything. It just makes problems worth. If you think back to the days of uh, President Nixon, he fired Archibald Cox and got a stronger prosecutor, mm -hmm. Leon Jaworski. The, mm -hmm. the investigation goes on. Now, unlike some others, I think he has a right to do that because, because of the Constitution. Article 2 almost certainly gives the chief executive the right to fire anybody, especially for cause within the executive branch. But I think it'd be a mistake. The investigation needs to continue. The president ought to continue to focus on opioids, Syria, North Korea, the other things that he's working on that help the country. As far as bipartisanship, how did we get to this point? When you think back to the... The 1990s, the Balanced Budget Act, it was signed by President Clinton, Republican Congress, bipartisan bill that made major changes uh, both in fiscal policy and as well as to Medicare. Then uh, the Obama administration, you had the Affordable Care Act passed without any Republicans. Uh, and then you fast forward to Trump administration, you've had tax cuts passed without any Democrats. What changed? Well, what changed, and I've got it in my pocket here, is this. You know, we live in an internet democracy, and, and um, the Congress reflects the fractures in the country. But I don't want to overemphasize the lack of bipartisanship. It's harder today, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. But, but I think of working with President Obama. I rode to Knoxville, Tennessee with him. He made an appearance there. On the plane, we talked about fixing No Child Left Behind. I asked him to do some things. He said he would. He did. We passed it. He called it a Christmas miracle. We'd been working on it seven years. It was a very difficult bipartisan accomplishment. And on the same trip, he talked to me about precision medicine. I said, we're working on 21st century cures. We worked for a year. It was very difficult. The vice president became involved. And Senator McConnell said it was the most important bill in 2016. So there still are uh, opportunities for significant bipartisan accomplishment. I'm working on things with Orrin Hatch and Dick Durbin on songwriters, with Martin Heinrich and Angus King on national parks, Patty Murray on opioids. It's harder than it should be, mm -hmm. but it's still there if you work on it. How do you work on it? Is it relationship Well, building? first, you, we, it starts with relationships. I mean, first you have to want to. I mean, but the way I look at it is it's hard to get here. Mm -hmm. It's hard to stay here. While you're here, you might as well accomplish something. And in the Senate, the only way you accomplish something is working across party lines because you have to have 60 votes. So bipartisanship is not my goal. Getting results is, and that requires relationships, trust. Senator Baker used to say, be an eloquent listener, because sometimes what the other person says isn't really what they're saying. And if you can understand where they're coming from and treat them with respect, sometimes you get a good result. Uh, candidates for Congress, they want to get to Congress. And when they get to Congress, they want to amass more power. And many of them run for leadership. You stepped down from leadership uh, in January of 2012. Why did you do that? And what has happened since? Do you look back and think that was the right decision? Uh, yes, I do. And I did it because I wanted to exercise more leadership. <laughs> really, the leaders, with all respect, <clears throat> have to really follow the pack. They can't get very far out in front of the whole caucus. John Boehner used to say, if you did, you'd be uh, just like a, somebody out in the woods taking a walk by yourself. Um, so I wanted to take a position on, on 
immigration, on fixing No Child Left Behind, on opioids, on the debt, on other issues. And I didn't want to have to wait or worry about uh, having to bring the whole caucus along until later. And I knew that if I wanted a result, I couldn't get just Republican votes. I had to be able to work with Democrats. The conventional wisdom, which is often wrong, but is that now that the big budget bill has passed, Congress is not going to do much of anything uh, until the election. Uh, as you mentioned, you're working on opioid legislation. What, what can get done between now and November, if anything? Number one, opioids. I mean, we, I'm going to a hearing with Senator Murray. We've had six uh, hearings. This is our seventh. We have a draft bipartisan bill. We hope to mark it up by the end of the month, work with the other committees. Uh, that's an urgent crisis we need to address. Um, Orrin Hatch, Dick Durbin, and I and about 18 other senators are working on modernizing the laws governing songwriters. That may not seem so important to you, but we have thousands of them in, all, in, in Nashville alone. Um, and the president's actually made an interesting proposal on national parks that could be the most interesting and biggest help to national parks you know, in 40 or 50 years. He would allow using money from energy development, revenues from energy, <coughs> excuse me, energy development for the $11.6 billion national park backlog. So that's attracted the attention of Senator Heinrich and Senator King, as well as Tillis and me, and we're working to do that. So those are some things. The energy bill that Senator Mikowski has worked on for a long time is a possibility. So anything that happens between now and the end of the year will have to be strongly bipartisan, mm -hmm. but it can happen. Do you see different agendas uh, with the House and the Senate? Uh, uh, the House is talking about welfare reform. Senator McConnell is talking about what you just mentioned, doing things that are bipartisan, transportation. That is not a top priority in the House. Uh, do you see a split there? Yep. I do, but, but that's just the difference between the Senate and the House. I mean, the House is a majority institution, so whatever, uh, if the country's in a fever, the House is in a fever, you know, for the next right. two years. The Senate is supposed to slow down a little bit and take a broader view, and if you have to get 60 votes, then you have to work on what will get 60 votes. The other thing I didn't mention and should have is we have to get uh, we have to deal with the DACA issue, the immigration mm -hmm. issue. And there's an example where I think the Democrats have made a mistake. I mean, we have a Republican president who campaigned against amnesty, against illegal uh, immigrants, who proposed amnesty for 1.1, 1.8 million people who were brought here illegally as children, offering them a, a path to citizenship. He produced 36 Republican votes for that, but only three Democratic votes. So. That should pass this year, but Democrats will have to realize that the Republicans have the House and the Senate and the presidency, and if he makes that big a shift, they should make one too. Do you think it's better for the administration to strike a deal on DACA slash the wall this year because in all likelihood there are going to be more Democrats in the next Congress? Well, you could make that calculus, but of course the minority in the Senate can always affect what the mm -hmm. final result will be. So I don't think it makes a lot of difference. I think what the president proposed was a pretty reasonable proposal by any stretch of the imagination. And the Democratic senators were thinking, well, we want 60 votes. Their idea of bipartisan was we'll get all the Democrats and a handful of Republicans. I think we need 70 votes, which is 35 Republicans, which we got, and 35 Democrats. What do you think uh, President Trump could do to foster more bipartisanship. Uh, he's certainly gone after Democrats, but he's also struck deals with, as he says, Chuck and Nancy. Uh, how could he show more leadership that would foster bipartisanship? Well, I worked with him on the health insurance issue that didn't work last week, and I thought he did a good job on that. I mean, he called me last August. He said, I want to repeal and replace Obamacare. But in the meantime, I don't want people hurt, so will you work with Patty Murray, come up with something? We did. I talked with him many times about it. The Saturday before the omnibus bill, I was on the phone with him for an hour with Senator Collins, Senator Graham. We asked him to ask McConnell and Ryan to put it in the omnibus bill. He did. They said they would. So I thought he did everything he should have done. I think the Democrats are so radicalized by the Trump presidency, they have a tar hard time being for anything he's for. 
in working with President Trump, what are some things that the public does not know about the president? Well, in the hour telephone conversation that we had, that's a question I got asked in Chattanooga the other day by two or three people. Um, he was very presidential. I mean, he, he first he spent an hour, right. this is on Saturday well, morning, right. 10 to 11, with three or four senators and his Secretary of Health and Human Services. Second, he was in the middle of a lot of other things. Three, he uh, listened very carefully. He let each of us say our point of view. And during the hour, I think he adjusted his position and agreed to do what we asked him to do. And then he did it. So if all you knew about the Trump presidency was that hour, you would come away saying that was a pretty impressive performance. Mm -hmm. We're going to open it up to questions in a minute. So uh, think of your questions. And um, I, I did want to ask you, do you see, you know, it used to be that we had elections, the losing side would say we need to accept what happened and uh, work on solutions for the American people. That really has not happened yet. Do you see that changing? Do you see frustration, like when you talk to your constituents, do you see frustration that there's so much um, polarization and nastiness in D.C.? Well, you see both. <clears throat> Everybody's divided up in two camps, and everybody says you need to work together. <laughs> so they say the same thing at the same time, right, and they're right. absolutely part. And it's all, so much of it's this, you know, we're, Congress is not immune to this. Uh, we're representative of the country, mm -hmm. and the country's split up. And Napoleon used to say, uh, you don't answer a letter for 30 days, and then probably you don't answer it, you just ignore it. Uh, sometime, you know, 20 years ago, you used to put an irate letter you wrote in a drawer and let it cool. Right. Today, you just tweet it out and see what happens. And uh, that affects the Congress. So that shortens the period of opportunity we have for, for, for the honeymoon period where you might get a bipartisan agreement more easily. Mm -hmm. We'll open it up to questions. We have people with mics uh, right there back in the back middle. If you can identify yourself and, uh, uh, and, ho and ask a brief question, so we want to get a couple in. Good morning, Senator. My name is Ryan Macklin. I'm a freshman at GW. Oh, Ryan. Good to see oh, you. Thank you, sir. Um, so being as you, uh, you are the chairman of uh, the HELP Committee, um, and you, we are talking about bipartisanship on big issues, I was wondering, what, where do you see a bipartisan bill going to reform um, the social safety net? Obviously, costs are rising. More, more adults are entering the uh, retirement age. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that's going to be something we're going to need to look at. But obviously, the two camps are very divided. So where do you see that going in the no, future? No, that's a, uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> that's, that's important right now, because everybody's criticizing, criticizing the omnibus spending bill from last week, or 10 days ago. They're shooting at the wrong target. You're asking about the right target. The omnibus spending bill is about 30% of the federal spending. It's under control. For the last 10 years, it's grown at the rate of less than the rate of inflation, and for the next 10 years, according to CBO's analysis this week, it'll grow a little more than the rate of inflation. So if your spending is growing at about the rate of inflation, you don't have a debt problem. And that spending is important to this country. It's national defense, national parks, opioid spending, national institutes of health, et cetera. What's out of control is the other part of the budget that you just talked about. It's 70% of the budget today. It's going, to be, it's going to be 77 percent in 10 years, and those are the automatic uh, entitlement spending. It's Obamacare, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. What can you do? Senator Corker and I have a bill to reduce the growth of entitlement spending slightly over the next 10 years, but that would save a trillion dollars. We don't need to cut it. We just need to reduce the growth of spending. It's going like this. And the money everybody's complaining about is going like this. We're shooting at the wrong target. In the, in the back there. Hi, Senator. Jay Kansar from the Hindu American Foundation. Mm -hmm. Another issue in immigration that doesn't seem to get the attention it deserves is the H-1B uh, backlog of green card applicants. Yeah. And these are tax-paying residents of the United States, they may not be permanent yet, but they could potentially become great drivers of the American economy, and they are primarily of Indian origin. Uh, and due to a country cap quota, there's a huge backlog of hundreds of thousands of, of these uh, applicants, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, they seem to be hamstrung. There is a bipartisan bill in the House, H.R. 392, that has over 300 co-sponsors. Uh, about evenly split between Democrats and Republicans, and there is a Senate bill. 
can you do you do you think that something could be done about this to address this issue and to remove this country backlog? It should be done, and I favor it being done. And I voted for a bill that would help with that in 2013 in the Senate immigration bill that passed with 68 votes, but the House wouldn't take it up. There, there are a long line of the smartest people in the world waiting in India to come to the United States and contribute to our economy, and we'd be well served to allow more of them to come. So I favor that. The, the, the problem we have, as we saw when the president proposed uh, path to citizenship and a, a generous uh, proposal for dreamers, when he then began to move toward a more merit-based proposal rather than family-based proposal, which could include uh, those kinds of visas or other visas based on people with professional skills, uh, the Democrats balked at that. So as long as everybody says, well, you have to solve everything at once, it's hard to solve even a bill that has 300 sponsors in the House. But you're correct, and I support it and would vote for it. Uh, one question here in the front. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. My name is Mia. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of things happen and that affect the general public, but it's not really emphasized in the legislators or any other branches. As a, especially, we say the justice and fairness. And a lot of people, it's just sort of innocent and got to jail. And a lot of, they say social program, they benefit the targeted population, but they don't really get it. But this kind of uh, things that happen everywhere, every day, and they spend a lot of government budget and a lot of abuse. So I just wonder if Senator can do anything about it, because it just affects our government expenditures, our budget deficit. Almost every social pro problem is all because of lack of justice and fairness. Well, I think the social programs to which you refer are an attempt to provide justice and fairness to people who are, who are less, um, who have lower income, for example. And even the recent tax bill, <clears throat> which was controversial, I was reading a report by the Joint in, uh, Income, uh, by the Joint Tax Committee, which said that it increased the progressive nature of our individual income tax. After the, after the tax bill, uh, the 20 percent richest Americans were paid, well, before the tax bill, they paid 84 percent of the individual income tax. 20 percent paid 84 percent of the tax. After the tax bill, they pay 87 percent of the tax. That people who make uh, less, the, 20, the lower 27 percent of people who, who, who in the income tax brackets paid 2 percent of the tax before the tax bill, and after the tax bill, they paid zero net because many of them received the earned income tax credit or other benefits. So I think our tax code and many of our programs are set up to try to provide justice and fairness to individuals of low income. One last question in the back there. Hi, I'm a freshman at American University, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, with the um, political scene at college campuses being largely polarized, how do you think we should, um, as students, promote bipartisanship? Well, you know, um, bipartisanship is, is, is kind of like race. If you want to make progress in racial relations, the way you make progress is not just to sit around and talk about race. I think the way you make progress is to go to dinner with someone of another race or room with someone from another race or start a business with someone, do something with someone from another race. So the way to do something in bipartisan is not to sit around and talk about bipartisanship on campus, but to say, let's pick a goal. Let's say we want to come up with a bill or a proposal to deal with DACA or to deal with privacy on the internet or something else. And let's get Republicans and Democrats and work together and see if we can come up with a solution. That's what we really, need to do more of in the Senate. That's what the internet democracy in which we're living makes more difficult to do, and that'd be a very constructive thing for college students to do. I'd make it goal-oriented, not just bipartisan. The goal is not bipartisan. The goal is to get a result, and bipartisan is the way you get there. 
we've run out of time. Please thank Senator Alexander for joining us this Thank morning. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, that was great. That was great. Yeah,